tonight, okay, a very special guest who's just joining me right now. Excellent stuff. Nick, how are you? Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Are you doing well? I am. I'm doing okay. That's good to know. Good to know indeed. So I just thought I'd uh, let everyone know, okay, for those of you that didn't see the episode last week, there's lots and lots to talk about tonight, and I'm really excited to have Nick back with me. So let me get my intro done for everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Spencer Lodge podcast in partnership with Najahi Events. If you don't know Najahi Events, go check out Najahi Tribe online. Uh, if you want to learn anything related to business development, currency trading, stock trading, you want to learn how to improve your life, you want to get more success in your life, you want to learn how to sell, you want to learn how to get your mind in the right place, then the Najahi Tribe has lots of courses there for you to go and access. <music> Tonight on the show, second time, I'm so excited and so really, really happy. Okay, for everyone on LinkedIn and everyone on Facebook and everybody also tonight on Instagram, we have the incredible, okay, incredible, okay, Nick Yaris coming to join us again. So if you've got questions this evening, please feel free to come and ask those questions. Nick will answer them for you if you've got them. Okay, let us know. Hi, Islam, how are you? Nice to see you. And I really want you to understand, if you didn't see last week's episode, then I don't know where you were, hiding under a rock maybe, but last week Nick shared his story and it really was something to behold. It was incredible. We loved every minute of it. So many of you were so moved by what Nick had to say. So many of you had questions as well, just to just couldn't believe what he'd been through. And the fact that he has the mindset that he has right now, that positive mindset that he's got is just, you know, that's a, a testament to him. So hi, everybody on Instagram. Thanks for coming to join us tonight. Hi, everyone on Facebook. Thanks for coming to join us tonight. Yes, Rana, Nick, finally, she says, so excited to be here. Okay, <laughs> excellent stuff. So, Nick, um, I think what we better do first of all, because there will be a few people that didn't see the episode last week, and 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 to be honest with you, they 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 need to have maybe five minutes, ten minutes of you just going over quickly your story up until the point we finished it, and uh, and then we can talk a little bit about what's going on with how you're helping people think about the coronavirus and the COVID nineteen and lockdown as well as uh, as well as that. So, Nick Yaris, thank you, everyone. Um, for joining us. And for those of you who don't know, um, at the very early age in my life, I had a very traumatic experience that allowed me to do all of the wrong things in life. Basically, I ended up in prison for a crime that I didn't commit, and I was sentenced to die. But the real story behind everything is what I did with that. And I think it's relevant to why Spencer's interviewing me now. I used all of the pain, suffering, and a, an endurance test of prison to eloquently answer every part of it with kindness. My development since prison has been a 16-year long effort to teach people about neuroplasticity healing. Right now, the number one threat to all of us is our mental health. And the terrible thing is, we really need to use everyone and everyone's past experiences to find a way to navigate through this stress. I was exonerated from death row in America by DNA testing in 2004. I moved to the United Kingdom for a while. I was there 12 years, and then I came back to the United States, where I'm now in Oregon. Spencer and I last week went over a lot of my past history. But really what kept driving me back to wanting to speak further is because that's where it always ends with me with people. They get the one shot of an interview with me, and it usually culminates with this very huge story of my early life, my prison life. And then it succeeds only into the briefest, what are you doing now? And I always feel at that point that I wanted to always wish that I didn't have to have such a big lead up to that moment. I understand its need. It impacts people. 
Um, I've saved thousands of people from killing themselves. I've gone through the experience of having so many wonderful people respond to me. But still in all, I always feel like there's something left on the table. So I wanted to come back right after I did the first interview with you. And I wanted to give people in real time what it is that I'm all about and what drives me now and what's getting me through this. It, the room that I'm speaking to you is, is a manufactured room. It's only about the same size as my prison cell. When I conclude my broadcast with you, I'm going to go on Facebook and I'm going to begin to teach people a series of lessons about a yoga form that I developed while in a cell that gave me an incredible body and it kept me sane while I was locked down. So I hope I haven't flubbed that badly, Spencer. I, I don't really ever want to just keep going back and harping on my story because that's not real to me. It's only part of where I came from. And I like the fact that I've added to it so much so I can comfortably answer any kind of topic and subject and question because of this. Let's talk about let's talk about your, your lessons while you were there and then how those lessons then inspired you afterwards to try and make a difference to other people and their lives. To, when, we, to, for so long in prison, I'm sure there's a million, a million takeaways and a million lessons that, that, that you learned. But when you when you look back on that time and you think about the because the, no matter what it is, I'm sure no matter how bad it is for anybody, that the, there has to be there has to be some positives and some good. And the work that you've done to try and get other people off of death row obviously was an inspiration um, to those people and obviously gave you a lot of meaning as well. Was it was it hard to find meaning? And did you find it easy to to look back after all these years with some positives from it? That was the core battle. What I realized while I was on death row is that I had a choice. I could give in to the bitterness and the anger, or I could try and decide to do something with this. And it, it, it comes down to a finite moment every one of us understands. Whether it's in a relationship or in our personal lives, we come to the Mendoza line where we know we can't go any further, but we have to make a decision. Do we continue on knowing it's to our detriment or do we try somehow to find something within us to change? And I saw all around me, I was 20 years old when they put me on death row. I was just a kid, man. Mm. And I saw in my first weeks, so many things that were just horrible. The violence alone was just so paramount to everything around me that I had to first and foremost deal with the vulgarity of the animalistic violence. Then I had to try and find some sense in being locked in a cell all day, every day with no new sensory input. And it became a real mental challenge. It made me really angry. I had nothing. So I had to make that choice. Do I make the effort to fight for what is truly important to me, my humanity? Or do, do I just give in to my anger and lose it all? And if you think about it, it's the core argument we all have about what is truly our core of our humanity? What it, what's it mean to you to be a human being? To others and to yourself. Well, I watched in a situation where in the course of my time on one prison block alone, 11 people committed suicide, a couple murders, I lived through a riot. I was tested. I was tested so badly by every extreme of being taunted for being accused of a rape and murder of a woman I never met. And worse being accused of being psychologically damaged to the point of going out and stalking this complete stranger. The guards had many a days of folly of tormenting me about what I was sent to death row for. But it came down to this. Every month I was brought before the uh, review committee. And it was professionals 
who did this to me mentally, and it kind of really hurt at first. Each month, I was brought before my uh, review committee, and I was asked to confess to my crime, give up my appeals, and tell them where my body would be sent. Could you imagine what that was like to a 22-year-old kid? Every month, they bring you in in handcuffs. They sit you down. They say, Mr. Harris, do you have any new issues for us? Do you need new underwear or whatever issue to you? And you go through your little petty thing. And they wait for it. Are you ready to acknowledge that you committed the crimes that you're here for? And are you willing to accept your punishment? We need you to fill out form DC-135-A so you can instruct us where to send your body when we execute you. You've refused to do this at this point. Until you do this, every month, we will ask you this until you give in. That went on for years, man. At first, I started getting insulted by it. Then, I started to play with it. I would go in there and be gregariously alive and happy and sweet to them. Why not? They were doing something evil. I wasn't. And I thought if I allow it to affect me, I'm being them. How can I complain about them when I'm being them? So, Spencer, I swear to God, every time I went in there, I began to try and be polite to them and reason with them that I didn't need to tell them where my body was going because I was innocent. And they said, you're insane, Mr. Harris. This is what led to you going out and stalking a stranger. You live in this fanciful world where you believe a truth that's not real. And I would forgive them. Because what else can you do to someone who's trying to actively make you feel low? It was a strange lesson that I had to learn every month. And it was strange that in the end, they gave up. Like they stopped asking me where to send my body. And I told them many times, I said, you don't have to worry about that. Just throw it in the street, set it on fire. I don't care. If you manage to kill me, hoorah on you. You're a bad ass because I think I'm going to win. And they would go beside them. What do you mean win? I said, I'm going to walk out of these doors. I'm innocent. And one day I'll prove it. They said, do you know how many times we hear that? I said, well, you'll never hear it from me again. I said it to him one time. And that was it. I refused to tell people I was innocent. You want to know why? What's the point? You live today in proof of who you are. Not yesterday because it's not possible. Not tomorrow. The things that you left people with yesterday, the only way to replace that is today. You have no other choice. And that's what I do. Since the day I got out, I have done so many remarkably good things and not one thing of anger. Why? Because I wasn't in a contest with them. It wasn't about me versus them. And it actually wasn't even personal. What they did to me, they did to thousands of people. So in the end, I learned that if you want to get through life without feeling low because someone's trying to make you feel microscopically small, forgive them. If you have the courage to forgive someone like that, aren't you an amazing person? It's almost it like, it's, it's like you, you wore them down by, by, by you kind of like where they were trying to wear you down, you wore them down. It's almost like you won the battle because you used kindness. Hey, look, I, there's a statistic that I read the other day that said that between three and 5% of all incarcerated people in prisons in America um, are innocent as a statistic. Is that a statistic that you're aware of? And do you know anything more around that? And going through that experience, surely, surely that frustration after all those years, surely you when you, you think other people must have been in there. You must have known other people inside that were saying they were they were they were innocent too, huh? All of my 16 years of freedom have been spent fighting for a man I met on death row named Walter Ograd. I'm waiting now for the news uh, media to do a new update on him. Do me a favor. Tell, tell his I story. I tell everyone. This, this deserves this. Uh, thank you, Spencer. All right. Everyone listening. 
Walter Ograd is a developmentally challenged young man uh, from Philadelphia who was asleep in his home, not a criminal ever, never accused of a crime, when two men broke into his house and attacked his brother and a woman his brother was going to marry in the basement. They killed the girl. His brother, Gregory, survived. Walter was called to the police station to give an interview related to this murder. The detective, noting that Walter lived on the same street that a little girl years before had been abducted and murdered and left on the street in a television box. He asked Walter about this and Walter befuddledly said, I know all about it. Yes, yes, I know all about that. The detective went out and got his partner and said, come on, tell my buddy now how you confessed to this murder. From there, 13 hours later, Walter was forced to confess to the murder of a little girl on his street. They put him in prison and they took him to trial. A jury, recognizing that this was not true, found him not guilty. But one of the jurors had a plan. He saw that all the others were going to set Walter free, so he deliberately sabotaged the jury's verdict by claiming that the others forced him to say Walter was not guilty and they declared a mistrial. They put Walter back in prison. They then recruited the Monsignor, a man who had heard more prison confessions than a priest, they said. His name was John Hall. Together with others, they came up with a series of jailhouse informants to say that Walter confessed to a murder he never committed. Walter was taken back to a second trial, and his adoptive mother died at that point. Because in the press they said he showed no emotion, the prosecutor had his medications cut off during the second trial. She also blurted out for the jury and for Walter to hear that Walter's mother wasn't even really his mother. She was an adopted parent, and she didn't even really care about him. At one point, crushed this kid. The jury found him guilty. They send him to death row, and he ends up on death row with the two men who nearly killed his brother. When I meet Walter in 1998, 1999, He's in Green County Supermax prison being tortured by these two men. Can you believe this? My first interaction with Walter was he was locked up in a law library cage and he asked me to read something to him and I blanked him. I didn't have no time for him. I went back to my cell and I said, who are you to do that to another human being? Don't you dare do that. The man was in the cell next to me. I would listen to him all the time. In the years that I was next to Walter, you want to know what his biggest complaint was? Not that he was on death row. He knew he didn't kill nobody. His biggest complaint was that the prosecutor lied about his mom, that his mom did believe in him. It would break my heart. That's all he would talk about, man. And I realized this kid's innocent. How could he be in the cell next to me day in and day out and never lie to me once? And I have a question for myself at that point. How could it be possible that someone, this someone, could go out and commit this very detailed crime and outwit the entire law enforcement community for years and then go back to being this person? How's that work? What, he had a moment of temporary brilliance? I've heard of temporary insanity. I've never heard of temporary brilliance where a befuddled human being who has a lifelong disability can come out of it for a day, commit a very ser a serious, complex crime, cover it all up, and then go back to this person. So when it hit me, I decided to stop all this. So. I had to beat the shit out of a couple of death row prisoners. I had to let them know 
I'm the big dog. You ain't messing with this boy no more. You're done torturing him. They used to play with him mentally, telling him that they had evidence to prove his innocence if he would take back the story of his statements in their murder of the little girl in the basement. I'm like, what? Don't fall for the shit, Walter. What are you doing? And I would see them trying to take every good or anything he had off of him. So I promised them exactly what I would do. And they didn't listen at first, and then they got the message. Then Tom Lowenstein, an author, contacted me and told me I had an amazing story. Who the hell else escapes from death row and hands themselves back in? There's got to be something there. Well, I told him, that's all fascinating, and I'm glad you want to write a book about me, but here's a guy sitting next to me who's completely innocent, and I got lawyers, and he's got nothing. You help him. And he did. He wrote a book about Walter. Then when I got out, I began this huge effort to go and fight Pennsylvania economically. Like you, Spencer, I understand economics. So what I did was I picked out five of the biggest European trading partners with Pennsylvania. And I went there and I asked them, why would you support a state that has the death penalty when the European Union does not allow trade to countries that kill people? Why is the United States given this huge exemption? Why is Pennsylvania able to profit from this trade with uh, the pharmaceutical Smith Klein Glaxo in England, who was going to manufacture the drugs to murder me? And I did this well before it became chic to attack the drugs that were used in executions. I then went to Sweden and I spoke to the Swedish government who was going to buy the Philadelphia Navy Yard and convert it into private shipping manufacturing in Philadelphia. And I asked them, why would you support this? Suddenly, people were afraid of me. It wasn't my fist that got me to stand before Parliament, address the Ligue de Nationale in France, and go all throughout Italy. It wasn't my fist that got me into the arena and stand in the Colosseum in Rome and address 20,000 people in my first 10 months of release, it was my education. It was this wonderful effort that I gave myself year after year to educate myself so that if I could have my chance at life again, I could do something with it. And I did, I began fighting for Walter Ograd. And yes, back to your original point, I quote the statistic of your um, mention that between three and five percent of all prisoners in the United States are factually innocent. Well, that's nice that you have a 95 percent correct rate. But that out of two million incarcerated human beings is over 60 to 80 thousand lives. 60 um, to thousand people in prison for crimes they haven't committed. You just quoted it due to math. What is, three, oh. what is 3% of 2 million? Yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it. 60,000. I get it. But it's like, I didn't realize there were too many people, 2 million incarcerated. That's, that's just a staggering amount of people that are, that are helpless. What, what's the, what's the, why do people want to put people in jail for crimes they haven't committed? Oh, you see, oh, you, you innocent little man. I love you. What is the United States' fourth largest industry? Penology. What is? Fourth largest is what? Penology. Really? Yeah. Manufacturing is always going to be number one. And oh, those things. But the United States' fourth largest industry is penology. All of it wrapped around a complex system that has been growing because of its exponential uh, uh, money-making ability. Who makes all those little tie clips with the handcuffs? Who makes all the guards' uniforms? Who makes all of their um, uh, uh, working ma materials from chains and everything? I mean, I looked at it. I am a, a penology expert because I was in every form of prison that I could think of other than exteriors, you know, the ones that were like underground. Do me a favor. Anyway. People are asking, what to just describe what penology is for everybody, please. Penology is the study of prisons. Penology 
prison industry, I should correct. I initially was in a prison called Greaterford in which prisoners are paid 17 cents an hour to make soap, sheets, towels, and pillowcases that are sold to hotels at a discounted rate. You can go online to Big House and, and buy Big House products, which are the prison purple uniforms prisoners wear because prisoners make them at slave labor wages. That money is going out the door. You have so many ways to uh, grip a, uni uh, a, a community with a prison and get money. This is why they build prisons in rural areas, because the community sucks the life out of it. The same guy who runs the wood shop owns the hardware store and siphons money off that way. In Huntington Prison, they caught millions being taken out of it that way. The other thing about penology and prisons, everyone in America is connected to the judicial system of one to four people. One in four people is somehow connected to the judicial system in America. Either a probation officer, prison guard, police officer, judge, prosecutor, victim, or offender. One in four in America are connected to the judicial system. That's why it's such a large industry. Privatization came along and Wackenhut began making billions off of incarcerated people because of technology where they have to pay $15 from their account to use a device like this to speak to an attorney or family member and their families are being sucked dry. The lowest echelon within America pay the highest price for penology. A person without a job gets arrested and is fined. That fine is never paid and he's incarcerated. During his incarceration, he's charged $53 a day for his incarceration. When he gets out on probation, he has to work to pay that or he goes back to prison. Some people serve 10 years for a simple offense because they make so much money off of the misery of one life. Now you get it. Devastating. Now, in again, is it is it correct in prisons in the United States that there <clears throat> that the way that it works is if you, you get like a three strike rule if you do your first crime, it's a they've done a, away with that one. They've done away with that one because they were putting people away for life with a stealing a golf club, and it was making yeah. them look silly. So okay. what they've done is they've created a like a cribbage score, so your past offenses are multiplied by three and five. So I have exonerations. The only convictions on my record is my escape from death row in 1985. The state of Florida was very petty and reinstated my conviction and wrote me a letter and said, I'm invited at any time to return to the state of Florida and serve out my 35 year sentence there. If I so choose, I declined. Anyway, <laughs> the problem in America is a person who um, now has no convictions for five years can get a clean record start. But you're always going to have a susceptibility in the judicial system because it doesn't matter how many years you go. You had an offense. That offense can really in, in, uh, enhance anything that you do. So I walk around as a convicted felon in the United States, even though I've been exonerated by DNA testing. I'm not allowed to do a lot of things that other people can do and the freedoms that they enjoy, but I never let it bother me. It is what it is. I ran and whether or not I should have run is still on me. So the, when you were let out for the, the crime you didn't commit after that happened, there's still you, 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 you had a previous record and then that's that's what stays with you to this day. Is that correct? Well, no. During my incarceration, I escaped from yeah. death row. Yeah, and I got I convicted of that. And I was convicted in the state of Florida for crime that I committed there. Hold on. And so the, state state of Florida, the state of Florida yeah. imposed, yeah, the state of Florida imposed a 35 year sentence because I was convicted of rape and murder in Pennsylvania in 1985 when they sentenced me. Yeah. When the rape and murder charges were taken off, they agreed that I would have never been sentenced so harshly. So they took it all back. But the ninth district prosecutor's office 
got in touch with Delaware County or vice versa. And they were trying to put me back in prison after the end. So this happened while I was still in jail. Then they were trying to come up with a way to cheat me out of my freedom to send me back to Florida and make me serve 35 years. And the prosecutor's office in Florida was trying vehemently to um, acquiesce to the wishes of the prosecutor in Pennsylvania who didn't want to see me walk free. So when that failed, I was set free. But after I was released and I was speaking to the French government, I got a notification from Florida. They reinstated my convictions. And if I returned at that time, it was up in the air whether or not I was actually going to have to go back to prison. That was my first year of freedom. So what, what, two, two things quickly. Can you just tell me the name of the book that was written about Walter? Because people want to know what that book's called. Um, yeah, Tom Lowenstein wrote a book called The, uh, the So-Called Confessions of Walter Ogrod. How do you spell Ogrod? Um, O-G-R-O-D. Uh, he is also featured. In, I gave up this opportunity. I was the only death row prisoner ever to turn down death row stories. If you look up season three, episode four, Walter story is highlighted beautifully there. Since that aired, the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office Integrity Unit took over Walter's case after every innocence project in America turned me down for years. And they found new DNA that doesn't match Walter, the victim of the little girl now pleads for Walter's release because she recognizes this man is innocent. And they still ignore her. Why? Because the judge that put Walter, uh, is handling judge, uh, the Walter's case now, is the former prosecutor who helped put him on death row. She shouldn't even be handling the matter. She's refused him a hearing. She's refused to address his counsel she has the dna evidence she knows about the victim's mother pleading for the release of my friend walter and she continues to blank everyone crazy that's a okay, guys if you got questions for nick then please please type them in we'll happily nick will take questions from you okay so <clears throat> how old is walter now 55 and when you there's obviously lots of other people out there that have touched you along the way and on your on your journey, you've campaigned for Walter for a long time. Have you campaigned for anybody else? Yeah. Uh, uh, Ernie Simmons, I fought for him. He got out, too. I also helped people before I got out of death row, did their legal work for him, got him off of death row. I got Lonnie Baker off of death row. Um, this is the one thing, though. Um, I'm glad that I'm on uh, this podcast with you. For one thing, you have a lot of great. Uh, many uh, wizened investors. I am about to make one of the best documentaries ever. If you think the fear of 13 overwhelmed people and blew them away, the new one, Finding Integrity for Walter, is going to be beautiful. So I'm appealing to anyone on here for investors. I can help, I you, will... with I can help you with that. I've got a director and filmmaker that's based in San Francisco that I, uh, called Louis, who was with me the other day. He made on Netflix, he made Game Changers and um, uh, The Code. No, and... I'm, just telling you, I'm just telling you, though, this is all right. So just so that you know in advance, I already have it written out. I've seen it. Look. This is one of those documentaries that is my opus, man. And I'm leaving it at this after this. Okay. And I did such a great job on Fear of 13 for one thing. I understand I have a talent and an ability before a camera. And with this material and with this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this wonderful, beautiful documentary about Walter. So if he survives, he doesn't have to scrounge like I did the first year living in people's basements and on the streets and stuff, man. Do you know, I understand one statistic you don't really know about, Spencer. For people who have spent more than 20 years in solitary confinement, 80% of them try to kill themselves in the first five years of freedom. 80% try and kill themselves in the first five years of freedom. And I'm guessing that's because they are incredibly lonely. No, there's two factors. One okay. is survivor's guilt. 
It's an overwhelming sense of the people you left behind. You know, I would, I, all right, I want to give you an example. I want you to imagine that I'm going to take away your identity and I'm going to put you in a new society where you know no one and everyone's going to laugh at you and think you are pitiful. Now, everything that you worked for to this moment, Spencer, your podcast, everything you did in business and school is to be erased and you're a laughing no one. How does that feel in your mind at that moment? It's just, that's how I felt. I was so important on death row that I, I helped other men because I wrote letters to their parents when they had scrambled minds. I, I filtered out their minutia to help them write letters cogently to their lawyers. I worked with people who had disabilities. I cared for them. I was their caregiver. What happened when I left that stature? I, I would walk down the block and dudes would be like, Nick, man, I love you, man. Yo, Nick, like I was so important. I lost all that. And I went out and people started thinking, this man has just spent 23 years, 8,057 days in solitary confinement. His mind's got to be scrambled. People would actually talk softly to me as if they couldn't imagine I wasn't somehow destroyed. I, I lovingly tried to embrace the fact that I had to deal with being super, super smart and not allowing anyone to truly know that because therein was my own ego. So while living in my parents' basement, I started a fight with Pennsylvania that led me to the halls of government. I used everything here and here in my heart to erase everybody's opinion of me. And that's hard, man. I'm one of the few who could do that. That's why it kills them. They can't handle it, man. I've, I've erased everything you are, Spencer, and then I laugh at you. Everyone thinks you're a nut. Wouldn't that drive you down? Wouldn't that break you? Oh, totally. Okay, let's take a couple of questions before we talk more, because there's, there's, there's people throwing questions at us here. Okay, so um, one question we've got, please, um, ha, um, how have you been released after that? And did they give you something to be, okay. So someone's asking, basically, one question, did you get compensation? And the second question, because you have a crime you didn't commit, and, and what was it like, um, what was the feeling you had for being out the first day? What was it like when you were out the first day you were out? So did you get compensation and what was the feeling like? First, the first, of, all, day? first of all, Pennsylvania has no compensation for wrongly convicted people. I got out and I was giving nothing. If I was released on parole, I would have been afforded health care, housing, job training and job placement. But because I was kicked out the door and not convicted in Pennsylvania of any crimes, I was told fare thee well. I was given five dollars and seven cents of my own money and sent on my way. That was it. Went home. That was it. Dude, and not only that, politicians were embarrassed to be seen by, with me. The way that they did it was trying to be able to sully me in any possible way by in pin, uh, opining that I might, despite DNA, I might somehow still be involved with the crime. And they played out this horrible game on me. So... I did the only thing I could, and this is why I am super strong. I listened to my mother. She asked me one favor. She said, no matter what you do, you have to be a nice person because if you're not, everything I went through, all of my tears and prayers were a waste of time. For me to pray for an angry person to get out would be my biggest nightmare. Don't let me down. She gave me neuroplasticity healing. Mm -hmm. Now, it took a long time, but I became the foremost expert on neuroplasticity healing over the last 16 years. So much so, I could write a 54,000 word book called Monsters and Mad Men in three days. Anybody who's read this latest work that I've released on Kindle will find a passage in it where I tell you how I had this story in me so deeply, I had to get it out, and I did it all in three days. 
so. 54,000 words just nonstop poured out. My brain is so fluid. I could write like you wouldn't believe. But if I do that, I don't come back to this world. Yeah, so I have to stop it. It took me three weeks to write the first book, four and a half to write the second one because I was torn about it and I destroyed it. The third one, I really tried to show myself just a, an ability. But then I met my wife, Laura, and she said, Nick, there's got to be some story in you, something no one else has. And I told her, I said, what if I told you that everyone thinking they know my entire story has no idea the story. I had no choice but to keep quiet. And I laid in her bed in Ilchester, England, and I wrote the book for her over the next three days. And it was incredible because she would come in and give me sandwiches or a cup of tea and, and grab a bit of it and go out with my laptop. And I hear her crying and laughing and laughing and crying. Like it's such a, a roller coaster of laughter at one moment where I hate to describe things, but it was just beyond belief what I went through. Imagine 48, 48 men are taken from the population of a prison from all over the state. They're all death row prisoners and they all have mental disorders. That's what you've been told as a prison guard. You've also been told that at any second, any one of these six psychos will rip your eyes out. So don't treat them normal. Then we're going to put you five stories high in a hermetically steeled unit. And you're going to have total control over these people. Go to it. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was next door to Gary Heidnick. Gary Heidnick was the person in real life that they developed the character Buffalo Bill for in the movie Silence of the Lambs. Why? Because Gary abducted women, put them in a pit under his house, and started to kill some of them to feed to the others so he could build his master race. Yeah. Buffalo Bill is based on a real person. Buffalo Bill, his real name was Gary Heidnick. Gary Heidnick saw the glory in his execution and demanded to be called sane and asked to be executed. The Pennsylvania courts de declared him sane despite five different psychiatric reports saying he was completely insane and they put him to death. That's who I lived with during this three-year period. He used to torment us. The power went out because of a huge flood. You look it up in 1995 in January, the Three Rivers area of Pittsburgh flooded. The week that went by after that flood was horror because the whole basement of the prison went, went into flood and there was no power. Without any electricity, there was no noise to drown out Gary. Gary began performing a ritual of telling us how and why he murdered women. And if you kicked on your door or tried to flush the toilet repeatedly to drown him out, the guards came in your cell and beat you up. For a whole week, they let him torture seven of us. On and on and on, playing out in falsetto the voices of the victim playing out an overriding need to tell us his, need, uh, his needs over humanity, his wishes over humanity, why he was doing what he was doing. It went on, man. Mate, I've got loads of questions here. I want to make sure that I get people's questions answered. Laura uh, on Instagram, Laura Russell has said, it's, 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 you want to see what comments I'm getting through here, mate, because this is fascinating. Okay, so I'll take some basic ones at first. First of all, Laura says, has anyone said sorry? Yeah, the, the uh, ambassador to Poland. The ambassador of Poland said sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when I first got out, um, I had the luxury and pleasure of being still close with people I wrote letters to. One of the things I told you is how I circumnavigated the globe by sending my hair to my pen pals around the world. Yeah. Well, I went to Poland 
and I was in Krakow, and I was right by the square where the trumpeter plays the song every hour. And I was in a small cafe, and I was talking to my friend and two university students who wanted to do an interview for Krakow University and all that. And there was all these people around, as I remember. I think I was just with my friend, actually. It wasn't the interview part. Anyway, I was sitting there, and we were talking about death row and everything. And a man, I didn't even notice, an American, turned around to me, and he said, Hello, Mr. Yaris. I work for the United States government. I listened to what they you just said to those people. And I want you to know, on behalf of the United States government, I, I apologize for what we did to you. And I said, you know what, dude? We're done. We're good. Because you said that to me, I swear to God, I'm going to forgive America. How about that? Wow. Wow. Okay, we've got some more questions. I've really got to get them out because people are asking. Um, so Phil says, uh, question thing, after release and fighting the authorities for what happened, are you not ever terrified that this will let land you in further shit? <laughs> you know... Worried that I swear, Spencer, if I ain't built for it, why am I out here, man? Okay, that's nice and simply after that. Um, Ashley says, um, in your opinion, Nick, do you think the prison guards help towards the corruption and contraband that enters into the U.S. prisons? Sometimes, yes, but mostly uh, a lot of good officers go to work. You're always going to have 5% of every profession be off the rails, aren't you? 5% of doctors are drug addicts, 5% of dentists are suicidal, crazy, right? whatever. It's like the 5% rule, right? Yeah. So in prison, you're going to have the 5% that are either power junkies who love going in there and messing people up and they love beating on people or they bring drugs in or do whatever. Okay. Uh, Peter says um, on LinkedIn, Nick, your voice aside is mesmerizing. The life stories must be shared. <laughs> How lovely is that? Um, I please, Peter, I totally agree with you. Nick is, without a shadow of a doubt, one of the most moving guys I've had on my show, and I'm very honoured to have the, the, the opportunity to spend time with him, and I genuinely am very grateful. James says, Nick, what a pleasure it is to listen to you. I spent this, <laughs> Spence, in my mind, is easily the most interesting person you've ever interviewed. <laughs> okay. Um you never know how strong you are until your only choice is to be strong. Okay, that's some more questions there. Anybody else got more questions coming through? Okay, my questions for you. Here, carrying on. Let's talk about. Um, let's talk about. How, how long ago were you released? How many years ago were you released? Two thousand and four. Sixteen years ago. And when did you move to the UK? Two thousand and five. Okay, so what made you go to the UK? I met a woman in uh, December of 2004 who promised to give me a chance to get away from Philadelphia with its 270 murders a year and me living in a basement. Okay. My first year was hard, man. Where did you meet? I end up uh, the night of my speech in Parliament a couple months before in London. I was asked to go to a big uh, law firm down on Tudor Street and uh, address all these amazing people. Like they had this black tie affair. And because I, I don't drink alcohol, I was standing off by myself while everybody was over there getting all their cocktails. You know, like there was huge amounts of booze. And I ended up standing in the vestibule all by myself. And she walked up to me and she introduced herself and gave me her phone number. I thought no more of it. I met her. A month later in Philadelphia, when she said she was over there uh, on holiday shopping and visiting. And the next thing I know, I was given a hand, uh, uh, an airline ticket to move to England and told that, you know, everything be cool. Well, I, uh, I went through a terrible experience where everything I, I really thought was going to be this delightful segue away from America and its troubles and everything. It kind of got bumpy, Spencer, and it's a shame because of things that I really feel badly for because I had I married uh, this woman and I had a, a child. And initially I was mommy and daddy and everything to this child and everything went well. But as you know, the UK court systems at that time were very heavy handed against the male. And the courts 
uh, said that I had no rights unless they assigned them to me. And then in a clever use of the court systems, I had restraining orders put against me for silly emails. And that kept me away from my daughter so much that at, to this point, I haven't seen my own daughter since 2013. Tell me how that feels. <laughs> like, no, that's not possible. I wish for once someone would honestly say that. That's not possible. There's no way to tell you how that feels. Sorry. It is the crushing, most singular hurt that I deal with personally outside of the SIDS death I've had to deal with with Laura. Our baby died in 2016. And you know what? People are fucking cruel. People thought that because I was on death row, and I was in the house when the baby dies of fucking SIDS, S-I-D-S. We all understand it, right? Must be this sick fuck did something. And he actually humiliated me like that. The police did too. He met me with some bull I was like, this is so silly. I'm one of the most caring, loving people you'll ever meet, you know? So yeah, I can't tell you what it's like to not see my child for six years after I did everything I thought when I got out to be happy. I'm sorry that I went through the experience. I tried not to be the vulgar party. I'm not the thief who stole her from her mother. It's the opposite way. And when you steal a child from a parent, it destroys that parent. And I paid for it. But I'm not going to sit on here and try and pretend that I own the vernacular or that I have some compassionate ability to eloquently tell you what it's like. It's a f struggle and it hurts. Tell me about the rest of your family. My dad, he lives in Philly. He's 85. He still goes across the street to get the newspaper. And he said, I'm not going to stop living. I'm not going to be stupid and go out of the house, but I got to go get my newspaper and feel like I'm alive. If that's my only sin, then I'm going to keep going. I was on my way to drive out there to get Walter when he had his hearing March 27th. I got in a pickup truck and I started to drive 3,000 miles each way to go get him. I crossed the Continental Divide, made it all the way to Wyoming from Oregon in a day and a half. That's incredible, man. 1,500 miles in like 16 hours, man. 18 hours. I, and I get on the phone to Gregory, Walter's brother. And he said, Nick, don't. What are you doing? You know, if you die from COVD coming to Philadelphia to get my brother, my brother can't handle that. You're going to kill him. He can't handle that. So I took it on the chin like a man and I turned around and I went back home, man. It was incredible, man. The things I saw, I met a homeless dude on the road and I said to him, dude, where are you going? He had two dogs with him because I'm going to Indiana. Can you give me a ride? I said, look, I'm already going back to Oregon. He goes, take me with you. I said, what do you mean? He goes, no one will talk to me. No one will help me. No one will speak to me. I said, it's because of the virus. He said, what virus? I said, oh, my God, you don't have a phone or nothing, do you? He goes, no. I said, do you know about this illness that's going around and everybody's on lockdown? He goes, all I know is about a couple days ago, no one would come near me. And every time I try to talk to people, they run. So I gave him a couple of dollars and some water for his dogs and I left him on the road, man. I couldn't take him back here. Crazy. That's why this documentary about Walter is going to be amazing, man. Somebody clever, please listen to me. I knew before I made The Fear of 13 what it was going to be. At the conclusion of my interview in Ealing, London in 2007, when I did that interview, it did come out for 2015. But I knew all along I did this. I did this amazing thing. And just that same feeling is within me now, man, because I'm going to use my abilities to create this wonderful documentary 
and I'm going to make sure that when Walter gets out, he's not embarrassed and hurt by people, and he doesn't have to think about killing himself. Okay, I got a question from Zoe. She says, Nick. Okay, and uh, I know Zoe. So, hi, Zoe. How you doing, hon? Um, Nick, have you truly healed your heart from all of the pain you went through? Oh, yeah. A long time ago. Look, I didn't take it personally. I tell people that the 23 years in death row was the greatest experience of my life and one of the biggest gifts of my life. How could I be unhealed from that? So Zoe, what I don't see it as is what you see it as. The thoughts in your mind that you might have to spend the next 23 years in lockdown would just devastate you. But during that process, only you could decide what that means to you. And me, I've decided long ago, this beautiful education of being able to quote many thousands of authors, being able to go back in my mind and relive the experiences of my first time of reading certain works or knowing so much about myself from my education. I really feel grateful that I spent so much time in that situation. I'm grateful that they because one of the freakiest things is I had a photograph taken with me and all these kids from my neighborhood when I was a boy. Spencer, they're all dead. The only dude that survived went to death row. <laughs> my, little brother's in the my little brother's in the photograph. My older brother's in the photograph. They're both dead. Billy Rumbellini, like I can count all their names. They were all with me when we, we, we cleaned up Elmwood Park. And the Globe newspaper, an old paper from Philly, took a picture. And we were all lined up down at the field house. Every one of those kids is dead. Drug overdose, murder, drug overdose, alcoholism, drugs, disease, murder. They're all dead. Why do you live in Oregon? One of the most beautiful places in the world. Are you in Portland Simply or somewhere else? Uh, no, 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 no. I'm way down on the coast where we have this thing called the Chetco effect, where it doesn't get above 80 degrees in temperature or around 29 Celsius, and it doesn't get below freezing often. We don't ever get heavy amounts of snow, and it doesn't get to uh, unbearable outdoor temperatures. Isn't that amazing? Mm, beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, there's a five there's a five mil, uh, a five mile ribbon of fog still left on this coast that protects us. If you want to go out and have a beautiful uh, 31 degree sunny day, go up the river system about five miles and park on the sandbar with your children and go in the river. It is pristine water. It is beautiful. Oh my God! This is when I was driving up here the first time. I felt like a kid in a candy store. I couldn't believe it was this beautiful. And I was going to get to live here. So I live in a small community with only 5,000 people. Luckily, we've been blessed so far with the coronavirus. I still go each day, twice a week, to humbly pick up food for my children at the school. I've been out of work. I lost my TED Talk. I was supposed to be in Copenhagen this month speaking for Amnesty International. And I was supposed to be speaking in London. I, I lost over $70,000 in opportunity this month, which was meant to carry us the rest of the year, and we have nothing. We're, in that, we're, we're at that point where they're going to cut off our utilities soon because we have no payments. We don't have anything. We've been just destroyed. And it's a shame because a lot of people are in our situation, but I understand what it's like to just humbly be quiet about it and not make a big deal about it because there are people worse than us. So. We still have the electric on for now, and we're still okay for now. And that's the way I'm going to go. I'm hard, man. This don't bother me. I don't go down. Talk to me about um, a day in the life of you nowadays. How do you fill your days? Oh, well, it's one of the things I have to be uh, mindful of is keeping the structure alive for the two girls we have in our family. My wife and I have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old here. We built them a schoolroom. We are making sure that they are staying up to date on their interactive school lessons and being a part of that is also to make sure that they come out and they play in our driveway. Blessedly, we live in a, a, a house that has a long driveway with a big fence. 
so they're able to run back and forth and play in a small inflated pool. This yeah. is really important because a lot of people don't have that. They locked up in an apartment with their child. Their child can't go out to the park and play. So it's devastating, you know, but structure is the key. If you can keep structure going, you won't go through this doldrums. And a lot of people are now faced with a three-day week. And that's not a joke anymore. I saw that. But yesterday was all of your day, and today is what you might be doing. But there isn't a whole lot you've been doing all week. And it's just been day to day. And that's what death row is like. People are starting to get a glimpse what it's like to have lesser and lesser sensory input from new memories from yesterday. And it's starting to affect them. Imagine an eon of it, man. I've got people commenting here saying, Nick, how can we help promote your business? We would like to help you. What can we do? We've got people. Only thing, yeah, only thing I can do right now, I guess, is try and get, I can't really do work. My work involves getting people to gather and listen to me speak. So other than the sale of my book, Monsters and Mad Men, on Kindle, I got no shot. I got no income. And I, I, I swear to God, I don't want to go. I'm, I'm offering money to any investor who wants to make millions with me on my art. The documentary I'm about to make, I've already been working at, and I believe that I have a hit. I also have a television show I want to begin when this lockdown comes out called the integrity unit there's one facet about the judicial system not many people know in the last 10 years thanks to other governments experiment the united states has integrity units my friend walter is being released from death row from an integrity unit's efforts not an investigation conducted by an innocence project journalist or some outside source this is all new, and this is why I want to promote it by going out and doing this wonderful TV series called Integrity Unit. So I wrote that out and sent it off to people. Well, we'll see. Spencer, I used to tell at times I was snake bit for all the things I couldn't get done. And then in the last couple of years, I saw the messages from so many young dudes whose lives I've saved, especially after I did Joe Rogan's podcast, man. You know, that yeah, I wasn't like, was spending time on Joe's show. Awkward, ugly, bad. My karma was off. I, I did a job on the podcast and I didn't do what I was supposed to do. One of the biggest errors of my life. But from it came these incredibly empowering messages from people who really needed to hear me speak. And it was wonderful. And I got a real blessing out of that to realize even on my off day, when I an interview, interview up the way I fucked that one up, people still get it and are willing to try and get it about me. And that's really cool, man. Look, um, one of the things that people, um, I would like to have them know the reason that I speak the way that I do is because of something a very good friend of mine made me recognize. Throughout the rest of your life, you're going to be speaking to yourself. Whether or not someone hears you or listens to what you say is down to them. And as such, you should try as best that you can to craft your voice to speak beautifully because it is so necessary to show love and respect for yourself. So I've worked diligently from early on by standing in front of a singular photograph image of myself. And I began to piously speak to myself in the hopes that I would soften my voice from the vulgar anger that drove it for many years. That I would use it knowing that the human voice is the most powerful gift we have. I hope that I go forward now with a podcast of joining in with others with eloquent speaking mannerisms. And I told Stephanie, your staff that put me in touch with you, this is my drive. I want to come on here like I am with you, but with others. And it isn't anything to do with my story and their story. I just simply want beautiful voices to fill the internet so that we have the eloquence of what we want 
not necessarily the content, but the need for that soft, soothing voice, just like it needed us to be calmed when we were a child and it was there, there. You'll be okay. We still need that, Spencer. Mm -hmm. We still crave it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's that's one of my days, man. I've been plotting and planning how to use my purpose for others. Guys, I get that. Guys, I know that you can all you're writing comments in. What can we do? Can we can we get him on webinars and Zoom calls and get him paid for doing that kind of stuff? We've got people saying, can you speak online? Well, clearly you can because you're here with me on my podcast right now. Um, so, James, in answer to that question, I'm sure I'll uh, I'll give you Nick. Yeah, any, yeah. Anyone needing to get in touch with me, it's Nick Yaris dot org. Uh, but that's my website. My email is nickyaris2013 at gmail.com. My first and last name, 2013 at gmail.com. Anyone needing to get in touch with me for speaking opportunities or uh, coaching ideas, things like this. Look, this is what I'm about to do. I'm sitting in a room I just built, and I told you I really want to start this. I want to start teaching people a, a form of kundalini yoga. Kundalini this, yoga. Yeah, yeah, I know about that. Yeah, because it it's taking the principle of that, combining it with force resistance and breathing, to combine it into a system that gave me an incredibly ripped body that left me at one point with only three percent body fat. No way, dude. I am. I'm fifty. I'm almost fifty nine years old, and if I show you now what I look like without my shirt, you're like. Yeah, that's because you go to a gym. I haven't been to a gym once. I don't go to a gymnasium. I don't need to. I cut my muscles to the point that they will forever stay like this. Like, I'm not kidding, man. This is incredible what I've managed to do. I hate to do this. I'm not in any way. No, but I want to just show you in all sincerity. That's real. You see wow, that? Wow, 59 years old. Look at the guy. 59 years old, man. 59, <laughs> baby. But if you see it, you see in my skin, I don't have the layers because if you do this early enough, your system will change. And once you change your system to cut all of the leanness into it, and then you properly stay. All right. So one of my key features is this. I don't abuse my body with food. Spencer, have you ever looked at st studies of digestion? We as human beings aren't meant to eat three times a day. My wife just came and said so. Okay, hey, um, can we get some coffee? <laughs> coffee. Well, the coffee. Coffee. Oh. <laughs> Excellent stuff. <laughs> no. No, that right. is so cool. I've never had a five foot two woman run me like this, man. She's like, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All sorry. Right. I, think I, I said five to two and a half. <laughs> Nick, as we come to wrap up this show and this an lovely hour and 40 episode, minutes, an I, hour and 40 minutes, we have been banging away. You and I, you and I could sit and talk for hours and hours and hours. And I promise you, I will do what I can once we're out of lockdown to get you over here to Dubai, because I know there's a lot of people that would love to sit and meet you in person and listen to your story. And so you can share that live with a live audience. I've already spoken to the people that have offered to put up some sponsorship for you and to find accommodation and uh, and a movement for you while you're here. Build the so studio. I'm going to start podcasting like you. I'm going to start doing this and I'm going to start doing teaching lessons and I'm going to try and throw because you know what really bugged me? What was my answer to watching people silly take their ego out and protest in the street? What was my answer? I Come on and complain? No, I'm going to do. I'm going to try and be like you, Spencer. You, I, I'm going to try and do what the Najaji tribe wants us to do. Use your mind and body for your society. Create opportunity for yourself and drive it all by good. And, you know, it's simple, right? Yeah. So, look, I know one thing. There's someone who was sitting there listening to us speak. 
They don't think that I got this about them. They don't maybe even consider that I was sitting there thinking this. I love you for holding on. I know your heart is troubled. I know you have some sincere issues that you probably feel like you're never going to be resolved, right? I promise you, if you can be nice to yourself the way I've learned how to be nice to myself, you will let all of that go. Because you'll realize at some point, you are the gift of people many, many generations before you were ever conceived. And their gift to you was this one wish that you would be happy, find good things, and be able to have meaning in your life. You owe it to them. You owe it to every one of them to let your point in this long lineage be a good point. I, I realized my grandmother, Hattie Shaw, buried three of her children in one day from the Philadelphia influenza plague. And she would tell me that story. And I would look at her like, how on God's earth are you not destroyed by burying three of your children in one day? And she would tell me, Nikki, I had to live for the other. I had to be there for the others. So we, despite whatever we go there, we have to be there for the others. So as much as I'm grateful to everyone offering to help me, I found that right now, I honestly felt it was more important to address that one person who has nothing to offer me other than their tears. Mm -hmm. I love you for hanging in there, man. Don't hurt yourself. Because I thought about this. I came close a few times to dying. And since then, I think about the many wonderful lives I have touched. Wouldn't it have been a shame had it gone the other way? And that's what drives me never to give in, never to capitulate, never to stop loving who I am because I mean something more to you now. Spencer, I get it, man. I'm not some dude you met on the internet. I'm somebody who really cares about you, man. And I hope going forward, that's what we keep alive during this lockdown, man. You're a great man. And somebody I have massive respect for. Thank you so much ladies and gentlemen i think we can all say a massive for instagram facebook linkedin i think all you guys a massive thank you for nick for coming on the show sarah's just saying you've helped me thank you so much nick Guy, guys guys there's people so, out there spent really, really get it they've been Sorry, so, so impacted so ladies and gentlemen please just give it up for the awesome and incredible dog loving and incredibly talented and loving guy, Nick Yaris. Goodbye, Ladies, everyone. And have a wonderful you. day. Thank you so much. I hope you have a pleasant evening, everybody. And I, if you want to get in touch with Nick, you know what to do. So I'll see you soon. And if you can't get in touch with him, come to me.